very good evening to everyone uh, i welcome every one of you who is listening who is tuned in uh, today evening for the fifth carl de silva memorial lecture and we have divya and uh, T, uh, shankar raman who will be uh, speaking on the occasion of the fifth carl de silva memorial lecture we have about 30 people who have joined us live on the stream and we'll begin with uh, the fifth carl de silva memorial lecture i welcome you all once again uh, for today evening's uh, program before we begin it would be very apt to introduce to all our uh, viewers and listeners about carl a very colorful person in life as colorful as his artwork carl was an inspiration to all youngsters in goa anyone who had an inkling of uh, love towards wildlife he has pushed several of today's well known uh, bird watchers ornithologists and wildlifers towards field based observation studies and has de uh, developed uh, developed this environment where people would look into wildlife and not just appreciate them but document them at their finer scales carl is a well known indian wildlife artist and naturalist who is most well known for his paintings of birds most important of them is the book of indian birds and when the centenary edition of this book was released carl redid all the painting all the illustrations of this book uh, that we have we see today in the field guide but carl was not just restricted to uh, birds carl drew anything that caught his eye in the nature and what was interesting about <laughs> this is his detail to his uh, to the uh, subject's eyes and ears and feet and this is a quote from carl himself when he gave an interview uh, to one of goa's leading dailies where he said that at the start of his career dr salim ali put him down once saying if you can't paint feet and eyes you have no business painting birds 3 years later after a lot of hard work carl proved him wrong and showed him his field work and since then carl has always uh, has been regularly collaborating with dr salim ali in various of uh, his uh, in various endeavors of carl uh, of salim ali in several of his uh, field guides where he has been a lead illustrator and in this period when he was working with dr salim ali he also received his first international uh, recognition where he became the first and as of now the only indian to have his paintings selected for exhibition by the uk based premier wildlife art consortium and it's not just the book of indian birds carl has several other books to his uh, credit the birds of indian subcontinents birds of bhutan birds of nepal birds of north india parrots of the world pheasants patridges and grouse of the world where he has rendered his illustration but a little known fact is that carl was a brain child behind the goa bird conservation network which is a 6 year old uh, non profit society which is registered in goa under the society's registration act goa bird conservation had uh, its roots back in 2010 when a group of enthusiastic birders came together uh, under the mentorship of carl and they started you know documenting birds and taking up issues related to bird conservation awareness and conservation in goa and carl has been the foundation of the goa bird conservation network one of the most interesting uh, aspect of carl was he would not hesitate to take the joys of wildlife to common people uh, a very good example a personal example would be when carl started, did an amazing initiative called birding by the year where he took the joys of bird watching to specially able uh, children Uh, especially visually impaired children where he could make sure that children still enjoy birds even though they do not have the gift of sight just through calls and touch so carl was an amazing taxidermist as well so he had taken the preserved specimen of birds feet beak uh, and you know allowed the children to get a feel of how a bird looks and showed them the world of birds just through uh, touch and sounds and that was carl's legacy and from him came goa bird conservation network 
So Goa Bird Conservation Network has been active for the past six years, and we have been doing several activities. A uh, lot of it has been in collaboration with the Goa Forest Department, where we have got, <coughs> where we have done several uh, surveys over the years in several protected areas, which has also given rise to several important documents like the long-term monitoring project in Kotiga Wildlife Sanctuary. Goa Bird Conservation Network is also the official partner of the Asian Water Bird Census, where we have been doing water bird count uh, in the state coordinator in a coordinated fashion for the uh, past six years, and we have been actively uh, co uh, contributing data to the IWC network. GBCN is also currently the official board member or the wildlife board member of Goa Wildlife Board, and has contributed to uh, several other important documentation and information uh, documents to the government of Goa. And that brings us to the fifth Carl De Silva Memorial Lecture, where we have Dr. Divya Mudapa from Nature Conservation Foundation and Dr. T. R. Shankar Raman again from Nature Conservation Foundation. Both the speakers would be speaking on two very related topics, where Divya will be speaking about hornbill conservation and the health of our forests, while Dr. Shankar Raman will be speaking about rainforest restoration and recovery of birds. Uh, both the personality, both the speakers and personalities today have so much to be told about that I couldn't fit all of it in the given time frame that I have. So here is a glimpse to Divya and a glimpse into Dr. Shankar Raman's work. So anyone who is interested in trying to get in touch with them, please go into the Nature Conservation Foundation's website where you could find their contacts and you could get directly in touch with them. And we also have today with us Madhura Nipatkar, who is a member of Goa Bird Conservation Network and is also a founder member of Goa Bird Conservation Network. Currently, she is with <laughs> the Azim Premji University uh, and she's a postdoctoral fellow in Azim Premji University. Previously, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Ashoka Trust for Research, Ecology and Environment. Madhura will be joining us uh, after the end of the talk by uh, Divya and Shankar Raman sir uh, to be part of the panel discussion which will be based on the questions that will be asked by our viewers. Uh, with that I kind of hand over uh, the uh, session to uh, Sridhar and Divya who will be uh, starting their presentation. So I would request them to uh, share the screen so that they can take over from us. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Uh, it's really an honor today uh, to be talking at this particular event, which I think is very meaningful considering all the contributions Carl De Silva has done for uh, the conservation and of among the naturalists in Goa. Uh, I hate giving talks, I must confess right at the outset. However, I cannot resist, it, resist anything coming from Goa because be it the food, the people, the ambience, the culture, uh, and we, and particularly so because uh, we spent some really amazing time way back in 2005 when we were carrying out a survey of hornbills and endemic birds. Uh, that was the time I also met Parag and Nirmal, uh, among others. And uh, since Parag asked me to speak today, I could not say no. Uh, and Thanks, Para, for this opportunity, and it's really an honor to be talking on this occasion. Oh, unfortunately, we never met Carl when we were there. Uh, however, I think his work lives on, and uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to briefly introduce our time in Goa, way back in 2005, uh, where we, uh, you know, I mean, although we started our survey in Goa because we just wanted it to be good and we had never seen those forests, it was wonderful walking in those forests, particularly Molem and Made, where we spent most of our time. We also visited Kotega, Konla, and a uh, very little time in Nets uh, after, after Goa, we went on to Dandeli and Anshi, and uh, it... it you know, we, we saw some, some of the best forests in the Western Ghats over there. Um, but although it was really nice seeing these forests, we also saw some parts of Goa, which I think 
most people as tourists don't get to see, which is uh, in many areas, even then, unregulated tourism, a lot of litter, uh, and most disturbingly, some of the mining and uh, linear infrastructure projects that were up then as well. But um, although it did worry us, uh, we had met some amazing uh, forest department officers like Paresh and Salelkar and very young naturalists like Parag and uh, Nirmal. And when we left, we felt that if it, it had such a vibrant and motivated set of people who are interested in wildlife conservation, maybe Goa is in safe hands. And I think it, is, uh, it continues to be so. And thanks to all the people in GBCN who are, uh, you know, constantly striving to protect the forest and biodiversity in Goa. With that, I'd like to go ahead. Uh, today I'll be talking on uh, about hornbill conservation and the role of hornbills in maintaining the health of our forests. Um, although everybody, I'm sure, uh, is familiar with hornbills, I'd briefly touch upon their ecology as well as their distribution and current status. Um, most of you might know that hornbills are found only in Africa and Asia. We have about 62 species of hornbills in the world. Uh, 30 of those are in Africa. And the majority of the 30 are found in Savanna woodlands and very few in the tropical rainforest. Whereas in Asia, we have 32 species and 31 of the 31 species are forest species. And we have only one species which occurs in drier habitats as well, such as the uh, our Indian grey hornbill. And in Asia, we also have many species that are endemic to islands like the Narcondam and Sulawesi, etc. And uh, these are, um, you know, uh, Asia is a, a high diversity area for hornbills. Coming to South Asia, we had 10 species, including the Sri Lankan uh, uh, grey hornbill. Uh, and we have five, five of these species are endemic to, the, uh, to South Asia, or uh, mostly to the Indian subcontinent. Um, and we have two centers of uh, hornbill diversity, which is restricted to Northeast India and Western Ghats, both of which have vast swathes of uh, tropical uh, evergreen forests. Or uh, even for those of you who are not, who have, who may not have seen hornbills in the wild, I'm sure if you have been out bird watching and using the Birds of the Indian Subcontinent Field Guide, which is the most used field guide in uh, in our country, you would have come across these two plates, which uh, fittingly were uh, illustrated by Carl. And uh, you know, even before I started watching birds or seeing, uh, watching hornbills or studying hornbills, I've always looked at these and familiarized myself with not just the hornbills but many other plates found uh, illustrated by Carl in this uh, field guide. Uh, we have nine species in India, of which today I will be mostly concentrating on the four species that we find in the Western Ghats, which are the Malabar grey hornbill, great hornbill, Malabar pied, and the Indian grey. And these hornbills, you know, you're likely to see one or the other hornbill anywhere you go in the Western Ghats. Uh, any of these four species can be seen, whether it is wet evergreen forest or drier forest, dry deciduous, river and patches, and quite often even along highways or in countryside and agricultural landscapes. Uh, when we carried out our survey in 2005 in Goa, uh, you know, most of the information was restricted to either scientific publications or sometimes uh, popular articles which were coming out in magazines like Sanctuary or Hornbill or something. And we knew very little about these species. Uh, and uh, so when we surveyed all these forests, it was like discovering everything afresh. And fortunately, we had a lot of sightings of hornbills in uh, some landscapes. And two of these key landscapes, which we identified as uh, important hornbill conservation units, are the Goa Dandeli uh, area uh, region and the Anomalies. 
in Goa and Dan Delhi, um, you uh, you find all the four species, but the most common species are the Malabar grey hornbill and the Malabar pied hornbill. And if you consider the entire Western Ghats, the Goa Dan Delhi Conservation Unit has uh, the most number of Malabar pied hornbills. And um, during our survey, about two thirds of our sightings were from this region. And uh, so we think that this is one of the best regions. And we had so many sightings that we were even able to estimate some baseline densities from our survey data, which was about one Malabar pied hornbill per square kilometer and about 10 uh, Malabar grey hornbills per square kilometer. In the anomalies, of course, we although we do have all these species, the uh, Indian grey is found in drier regions and in the plains. Uh, the Malabar pied hornbill is restricted to the riverine areas of Varachal Reserve Forest, and they are not as common as in the Goa Dandeli area. Uh, uh, however, Anamalai seems to be a much better region for the conservation of great hornbills in the Western Ghats. Uh, but now I think we have some amazing, uh, uh, much more information where many people have come together and contributed to uh, online citizen science portals like the eBird. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we now have much better understanding of both the frequency of occurrence of these species across the country, uh, as well as their distribution. Uh, and over here, you can see that the Malabar Grey Hornbill uh, is clearly uh, it occurs right along the Western Ghats, but there are certain pockets where they are much more frequent. And uh, similarly, uh, for Malabar Pied Hornbill and the Great Hornbills also, you can see that they are either more patchily distributed and there are fewer hot spots of, of their, uh, 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 with greater abundance of these species. And coming to Goa in particular, like, just like how we had found way back in 2005, uh, certain regions are really good for Malabar pied hornbill and Malabar, uh, Malabar grey, uh, which is the forest surrounding Molem. And uh, the Indian grey and the great hornbills are much rarer. Now, what I'd like to uh, draw your attention to is the data that we've got for to... Um, analyze this, uh, it's about six, 16,000 checklists, unique checklists, and the hornbills have been reported in about 600, uh, sorry, 2,500 checklists from, from about 600 observers. I was slightly surprised because I feel that the, this is a fairly low number, and I it would be really interesting to uh, look at why this is so, because I believe that the uh, birding, uh, you know, the, the, the birding groups are quite active in Goa. And uh, at this point, I'd really like to make a request that everybody contributes their data to these online uh, citizen science portals, because it can definitely add to our understanding of of the species, even of common species like the hornbills, which are uh, really hard to miss. We also have uh, another portal, uh, which is being uh, run by one of our colleagues, Aparajita at NCF. And uh, this is also to encourage bird watchers, photographers, amateur bird watchers, naturalists, everybody to contribute to their hornbill sightings in particular, because there might, I mean, you cannot mistake a hornbill, whereas everybody who watches hornbill need not be, uh, you know, really good bird watchers like myself. I think I'll never miss a hornbill, but I, I do miss a lot of other birds. Uh, and uh, this is a graph from one of their recently published papers which looked at three years of data. And once again, as you can see here, we've had only about a thousand records uh, by, by, if I remember right, about 300 people, I think, 300 or 400 observers. 
And uh, that's really unfortunate because there are so many photographers out there who are photographing hornbills. And it would be really wonderful if they could contribute to citizen science uh, uh, databases such as these. Uh, in addition, I'd like to bring your attention to uh, to one more thing on this graph, which is look at the Malabar Pied Hornbill Bar and the Malabar Grey Hornbill Bars. Uh, you can see that there are clearly lots more reports of these hornbills from non-protected areas. And this, I think, is an important takeaway where uh, for hornbill conservation, we cannot only concentrate on the protected areas. We also need to look at a much larger landscape and outside protected areas for conservation of hornbills like the Malabar Pied and Malabar Grey. Uh, to, to briefly uh, introduce, you know, the horn, hornbills are not popular just because of their size, but they're also popular because of their unique breeding habit, which is that they nest in hollows, tree hollows. And these tree hollows are not excavated by themselves, but they use existing hollows. And for hornbills, they need very large trees with tree hollows that are suitable of, uh, to hold them. And the female incarcerates herself for up to four months sometimes, and the male feeds the female in the nest. Uh, one more important thing is that, that uh, they're probably limited by the availability of these nest cavities, and the hornbills tend to reuse these trees for many years. In a recent survey that we carried out in the Anomalies, we found that some of the nests that uh, which I had discovered or known uh, in early 1990s are still being used. And uh, I, I, I just put this to give you a little break where, you know, Rohan Chakravarti, as usual, makes uh, natural history much more interesting with his uh, art. And this is what it is like where the female has to be fed constantly by the male and later on even the chicks and the demand on the male is quite high. And so what do they feed on? During the breeding season, most hornbills free, uh, feed a lot on fruit, uh, particularly of some uh, families of, say, Lauraceae or um, figs, Meristicaceae, and a few others. Figs are very, very important. The largest species of hornbills feed mostly on figs uh, during the breeding season. The smaller species feed a little less on figs, but then they feed on a much wider variety of fruits. And these being frugivores are very, very important seed dispersers in, in the forest. And this is where the health of the forest, I, I connect the presence of hornbills to the health of the forest. And uh, there is very, very high variability in the availability of fruits within the forest. And therefore, these hornbills definitely do much better in forests which are highly diverse. Uh, and uh, have a lot of different kinds of fruiting trees right through the year. And uh, these are important eastern resource. Although they're known as fruitivores, very often people do get, you know, kind of surprised when we tell them that they feed on a lot of animal matter as well. Anywhere between 1% to 10% and sometimes in the smaller hornbills up to 30% of their food during the breeding season could be animal matter. So uh, I think over here I was saying that although they are frugivores, they do eat a lot of animal matter, particularly during the breeding season. Uh, they do look at small mammals, including bats, uh, rodents, uh, and sometimes even uh, birds and bird fledglings. Uh, how in the breeding season they are itinerant, they range very widely, they track fruit availability across much larger landscapes. Uh, they also move around in large flocks and roost uh, uh, in large congregations, where which also helps in dispersal of seeds. Um, also, more recent studies and different surveys are, uh, in various regions have shown that they are adaptable despite their uh, 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 specific requirements of large trees and uh, uh, 
particular food tree species. And uh, they can be found in plantations and agroforests, which have uh, potential nesting trees as well as food tree species. Uh, they particularly do well in landscapes which have uh, even small patches of forest as fragments. Although they are adaptable, uh, you know, uh, one of the largest uh, data sets was, was used to look at uh, trends in their uh, frequency of reporting. And I think it's the first of its kind uh, analysis and data presented by State of India's birds. If uh, you people have not seen it, please go and have a look at State of India India's birds website, where you will see that uh, you know, for the first time for India, we are able to estimate or look at trends in bird populations uh, based on data contributed by various kinds of people. And uh, what is worrying for me is that even the hornbills are showing a declining trend, particularly the Malabar grey hornbill and the great hornbill. The Indian grey hornbill, on the other hand, seems to be doing quite fine. Uh, and the Malabar grey hornbill have probably declined so much that uh, we are, in fact, um, suggesting that uh, their IOCN uh, listing be upgraded to vulnerable from least concern. For Malabar pied hornbill, however, uh, we are not seeing any particular change, but we do not know whether this is because of uh, very limited data. Uh, therefore, I would like to urge once again all the viewers to contribute whatever sightings you have of uh, uh, hornbills and other birds to uh, databases such as eBird or Hornbill Watch. Um, and as we all know that there are lots of threats still uh, you know, persistent and probably becoming much worse along the Western Guards, which includes or uh, conversion uh, or yeah uh, yeah conversion of forest uh, for other uh, projects particularly hydropower projects mining uh, etc and uh, <clears throat> so this has a very vicious cycle uh, all, although hornbills could adapt to these late changing landscapes i think in the long term, they are going to have, um, they will be affected as well as the forest. Uh, so over here in this schematic uh, uh, flow chart, you will see I've put, hunt, I mean, I've used hunting uh, and logging, but this is uh, a schematic chart, uh, chart from another study. Basically, uh, hunting or logging or any other kind of disturbance would lower the densities of both hornbills or their food trees. So either of these could affect the other uh, because if there are not enough food trees, the abundance of hornbills also could go down, which means that they will not be uh, dispersing seeds of typical rainforest, uh, single seeded, large seeded fruits, which would in turn uh, affect the plant recruitment and regeneration and therefore the health of the forest. And uh, similarly, if the uh, hornbills disappear, again, we do not have uh, uh, them dispersing seeds. And uh, some of the large seeded plants in the rainforest or in, in any forest of the Western Ghats are dependent on hornbills, like many st recent studies, sh studies have shown. And both in the Northeast and uh, a study in the Western Ghats has shown that Forests without hornbills have very few seeds arriving uh, in these forests and therefore in the long term these forests will be less diverse and less capable of uh, supporting species such as the hornbills. And this is where the health of the forest and the hornbills are interdependent and we really need to look at them uh, together and uh, not you know, uh, not as separate from each other. I mean, the, I, in, in the case of hornbills and their role as dispersers and forest health, there may not be much redundancy. 
And however, uh, we still do not, I mean, we know some of these basic ecological facts and uh, in recent times there have been much better studies, but I think we still need much more research, long-term monitoring of uh, trends of uh, populations of these hornbills, particularly in key conservation areas like the Goa Dairy and in the Anomalies. And we cannot afford to lose the nest sites of uh, food trees uh, or any of these things which uh, which are required for hornbills to uh, to continue to exist in these landscapes. And these can also be protected with increased awareness among the people. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, GPCN uh, for this opportunity and many uh, funding agencies and others who've helped us continue our work on those Thanks a lot, Divya. Uh, I will now request. Uh, Dr. Shankaraman to take over from you for his uh, part of the talk. And then uh, there are already a couple of questions that have been uh, asked by all our listeners. So we'll take it up at the end of uh, the talk. So uh, Shankaraman, sir, if you can take over uh, from here. Um, thank you uh, uh, once again uh, to uh, GBCN for uh, inviting us to you know, to deliver this uh, talk uh, in, in memory of uh, Carl de Silva. As uh, Divya mentioned, uh, uh, we have not been fortunate to have known Carl de Silva, um, but, uh, you know, it's clearly he was one of the things that uh, uh, we missed in Goa. Goa is a place that uh, we, uh, we love a lot, and uh, it would have been wonderful if we had had the opportunity to meet him in person. But having said that, I must say that uh, you know, uh, in my life uh, as a as a scientist, as an ornithologist, as someone watching birds, which I've been doing for over three decades, I must say that uh, in the last uh, uh, two decades, I must have spent literally uh, you know, thousands of uh, occasions when I've been looking at the work of Kalatwa. We you know, repeatedly referring to his beautiful illustrations in the lives. And a, a very fundamental aspect of uh, most of my work has been the, the bird species. You know, you need to know what you're looking at, you need to identify the species correctly. And in his beautiful illustrations, very accurate and very beautifully rendered illustrations, uh, is the, you know, it's the fundamental step towards uh, getting to know what is the bird that you're. Uh, that you're looking at. So although we uh, have not met Carl in person, we have literally been with him almost every day of our uh, you know bird watching lives. So uh, uh, on that note, I you know I'd like to uh, uh, say that uh, you know thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, to speak uh, in, in 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 his memory. Uh, today, what I'll be talking about is uh, our work on. Uh, in, in rainforests in the Western Ghats, particularly in the Anamala Hills, and how it connects to our efforts to understand what's happening to bird populations here, uh, and uh, whether bird populations are recovering when we try and uh, also restore the rainforests that is their habitat. Um, I, I think many of you would be familiar with uh, these kinds of images today. Uh, the fragmentation and loss of forests is a worldwide phenomenon. And the loss of forests in the tropics is of particular concern because of the huge diversity of species that resides in the tropics. And forest fragmentation is one particular kind of transformation of, of landscapes that we see here. In these photos, and you know, on the left, you can see a, a, uh, an area of forest which has been cleared for pastures, leaving small bits of forest uh, in, uh, in, in, in the middle. And this kind of forest fragmentation has many different effects. Uh, we often have uh, what is called the area effect, where sizes of forest patches are reduced. Then there is the effect of increased isolation. There are patches of forest which are far away from other um, patches of forest, and it may differ also species between these patches. 
in, in many cases, and that's uh, an effect of increased isolation. The shapes of these forest patches also change a lot, and which leads to increased uh, edges, and edges of forests are susceptible to a lot of other kinds of disturbances and you know uh, changes with values on the edge of things. These are some of the top changes that occur when uh, forests do get fragmented. On the right side, you see a, a patch of forest which is in the middle of a key estate in Western Ghats, the kind of landscape where we uh, do a lot of our work. And what studies from other parts of the world have shown is that when forests are reduced to smaller patches and when they become more and more isolated in the middle of uh, other kinds of land use, they tend to lose a lot of species. So we're saying basically that uh, there's been a, a wide uh, range of work around the world which shows the uh, detrimental effects uh, that forest fragmentation and degradation has. And in fact, some biologists have gone all the uh, way to say that by the end of the century, the world's remaining tropical forests will be left mostly in a fragmented, simplified and degraded state. And uh, uh, they see these areas as the living dead or tiny remnant populations which have uh, very little future. And um, so in this light, we were very curious when we started our work here in the Western Ghats to look at what is the uh, case as in, in the landscapes where we work in. So what happens to birds when one extensive, once extensive rainforest tracks are broken up into smaller pieces, what we call fragments? Uh, what happens around these fragments where uh, the land is transformed, say, into plantations like tea and coffee? Uh, how do birds respond to the change in, uh, in, in land use from forests to other kinds of uh, plantations? And then finally, if you have areas that have historically been uh, degraded due to whatever reason, can these forests be brought back in some way through ecological restoration? And if you do manage to do that, will the birds also follow? So these are the sort of questions that motivated much of our work. And the work that we carried out has been focused on a uh, fragmented you know, plantation rainforest landscape here in the Anamala Hills, which is in the southern western Ghats. Here's an aerial view of a part of this landscape. You can see a rainforest fragment in the middle, and you can see a degraded sites, and you can see that the fragment is surrounded on all sides by largely a monoculture of pea plantations. But there are also other landscape elements like roads and settlements, there are coffee plantations, there's eucalyptus plantations. So we have tried to understand uh, how, uh, you know, how do birds respond to these kinds of changes, both within the fragments as well as around them. And I'm, I won't go into the details of the methods that we used and, you know, how much work uh, has happened here. Uh, basically, I will just say that what I'm about to present is based on work done between the year 2000 and now by myself and a number of other students who have gone into these forest patches, who have gone into the plantations and they've, you know, done... Uh, several thousand point counts for to you know count birds they've done, done scores of uh, line transects to look at what birds are there we've put plots to study the vegetation and then try to uh, you know connect the dots and see what the uh, patterns and trends are so if you look at a range of forest fragments in this kind of landscape we see one very broad trend so in this figure here if you look at the bottom, you'll see that there is a, a, a range of area that is the size of the forest patch growing from very small, like one hectare, to more than 3,000 hectares. So this is the range of forest patch sizes that we have surveyed. And you find that there are some species that do better, actually, in smaller fragments. Or in, in other words, their abundance increases in the small patches. Uh, these birds are what we call open country birds, birds of the disturbed habitats. They are very widespread species. Many of them are not even rainforest birds. They are birds like, uh, for instance, the uh, common tailor bird and uh, red whiskered bulbuls, which are very widespread. They do well in smaller patches and they tend to decline as the size of the forest patch increases. There are other birds that do better in larger patches. For instance, Malabar trogans, Asian fairy bluebirds, and many of these forest birds, the typical rainforest birds, uh, are uh, do better in larger fragments. But what I'd like to highlight is that what this uh, figure shows is that the threshold of area which seems to influence birds is actually quite small. 
for most species, the threshold of area is less than 100 hectares. For In fact, for most of them, it is even less than 20 hectares. What that means is that even small patches of forest, a few hectares in area, can support many uh, rainforest bird species. Um, another finding that we had was, which was very different from what was found in other parts of the tropical uh, you know, world, is that the number of bird species that you find in a forest patch did not show any trend in relation to area. If you look at the top left graph, it shows the number of bird species, the total number of bird species. It looks almost flat. There's a lot of variation, but it's almost flat from very small patches to very large patches. Um, of course, this includes both the open country birds and rainforest birds. If you look at rainforest birds alone, you find the more common trend where there is a little increase in as the forest patch increases, you tend to add more species, but it very quickly increases. Even when a, a forest patch is uh, uh, just about 20 hectares or so in area, it has a lot of the rainforest bird species that you tend to expect to see even in larger patches. And this uh, trend is sort of true uh, in the case of abundance, except that it is slightly um, inverted. So there's a lot of change as you go from very small patches to a threshold of about 20 hectares or so, after which the bird density does not change much across the entire range. What we found uh, also, which was uh, in, our, in our research, which is a, it's a matter of concern, is that the abundance of birds, particularly the endemic birds, appears to be decreasing over time. So uh, if you look at the graph on the left, that is data from the Anamala Hills. And we find that if you look at just the endemic birds, the density of the endemic birds appears to be declining uh, across, uh, across the years. And this pattern that we found after many, many years of effort with so many different observers and so on, is also beautifully captured in the State of India's Birds Report, which was released this year, which Divya also referred to. And this, the graph on the right side is from the State of India's Birds Report. And that is data gathered by amateur um, you know, naturalists as well as uh, other ornithologists pooled in the eBird data portal. So the citizen science contributions has really helped us to look at these patterns. You see three, three lines there. The uh, green and the orange are birds that are not endemic to the Western Ghats. They're more widely distributed species. Whereas the red line, which is showing a sharp decline, are actually the Western Ghats endemics. Now, why is this happening? We don't know, but this is definitely a matter of concern. Our work also showed that the quality of the, uh, uh, the forest is very important in determining what kinds of birds are found there and what fraction of them are rainforest birds. So if the sites are very degraded, then they tend to have more open country birds and fewer rainforest birds. If they tend to look more like the uh, uh, photo on the right, uh, an old growth forest, then they tend to support more rainforest birds. And the reason why I mention this is because even in small patches, sometimes you have a small patch of forest that is actually in very good shape or relatively good shape, like uh, the site on the right side. And in, in, in such a case, they also support quite a few rainforest birds. So just to summarize this part of the uh, talk, uh, uh, some of our key findings are that at the landscape level, fragmentation actually leads to an increase in species richness because many species which typically would not occur in a rainforest area uh, also come into the landscape and they are found there. But as forest path size decreases, it does affect many rainforest bird species, but with fairly low area thresholds, as I, man as I mentioned. And what matters more in, in, in determining whether a bird is found in a patch or not is the quality of the habitat more than the size of that forest patch. Um, and uh, uh, finally, the alarming declines in abundance of rainforest birds, particularly endemics, is something that we should be worried about. Now, all of this is related to what is happening to birds inside forest fragments. What about the plantations around these forest fragments? So we look particularly at you know, tea and coffee plantations. So here you can see tea plantations. And as you know, tea plantations are intensive monocultures. There's hardly any uh, you know, tree cover. And, uh, but there are a range of different kinds of tea plantations. We looked at conventional tea plantations, which look like the ones on the left. 
um, uh, we looked at organic tea plantations, which will also look like the ones on the left, but it's just that they are organic. And then there are mixed shade tea plantations, which also use uh, a number of you know native shade trees, which are distributed among the tea plantations. And we compared them with both continuous forests inside the Anomaly Tiger Reserve as well as forest patches. And interestingly enough, although tea plantations have got a lot of bad press, so to speak, in terms of whether they can support birds or not, we found that uh, there is actually, in terms of the abundance of birds, quite a lot of birds that are found in tea plantations, particularly in tea plantations that have native shade trees. So if you look here, for instance, the abundance of birds appears to be somewhat higher in the shade tea plantations as compared to even rainforest patches. But I uh, highlight here that this is all birds put together and this is the total abundance. This includes many birds like the red whiskered bulbuls, the common tailor birds and the open country birds, as well as the rainforest birds. If you look just at the rainforest birds, what you see is a slightly different pattern. You see that conventional tea and organic tea actually don't have very low levels of uh, rainforest bird uh, species. And you have the, uh, at the other end, you have the, you know, forest fragments and the continuous forests, which have most of the rainforest bird species found. But interestingly, just having a few native shade trees distributed uh, through the tea plantation appears to have uh, give a substantial boost to how many rainforest birds the landscape can support. Now this is uh, in tea and we found somewhat similar results in the case of uh, coffee plantations. But just to summarize the effects in, 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 in tea plantations, you find that there are many birds in tea plantations, but actually very few are rainforest species. And there is only small gains in uh, a tea plantation going organic, at least as far as the uh, birds are concerned. But there are much larger gains if we can use and bring more native shade trees in tea plantations. And like I said, that uh, is something that we also learned when we looked at uh, uh, coffee plantations in the landscape. You have a whole range of coffee plantations which have different kinds of shade trees. I think um, most of you would know that coffee is grown under the shade of trees and that way uh, can potentially support a lot of uh, forest birds as well, including the canopy birds. And that's, um, you know, what we were able to uh, document as well. But the point I would like to uh, uh, make here in relation to coffee plantations is that they uh, provide a very interesting influence at the landscape level. So on the left here, for instance, you see a rainforest fragment that adjoins a coffee plantation. You can see how it's almost difficult to make out the difference between the two because of the extensive tree cover in the coffee plantations. In that sense, the coffee plantation acts like a buffer and it uh, increases the landscape connectivity and it also helps to support uh, a wider set of birds. Whereas on the right side, you see a rainforest fragment which is surrounded by reservoirs and tea and where the landscape connectivity is much lower. And what we found when we analyzed the data is that although the structure of the habitat in, in plantations can influence uh, the birds quite strongly, particularly, you know, what kind of native trees are used and how many of them are used and how many species, the, uh, they have a substantial influence in, in terms of uh, providing a, a buffer habitat around forest patches. So the surrounding habitat around forests also matters. Uh, we cannot focus our conservation efforts only on the forest patches that remain. Uh, the quality of the habitat which is around these forest patches also matters and can help support more birds in the landscape, not just inside the forest, but also in the uh, in, uh, in habitats such as these plantations. So that's another takeaway from this, this work. Now, um, uh, I will just uh, go ahead uh, to talk a little bit about uh, restoration. I think Divya has extensively spoken about how many of these forest patches are disturbed and fragmented and that leads to uh, loss of uh, species and you know uh, ecosystem functions like seed dispersal. And often what we have are forest patches that are quite degraded in, in the landscape. And ecological restoration is a, is a field of work where we try and ask the question whether over time and you know it's indicated here by this dotted line when an ecosystem is declining in over time can we try and bring it back to a better state by through an intervention so our work on ecological restoration has focused again in the anomaly landscape 
where we have tried to raise a large diversity of species, more than 160 different uh, species, and planted these out in different kinds of degraded rainforest fragments. I can give more details later of how we go about and do this, but uh, this work, uh, and I can also show it to you in, 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 a, in a few photographs. For instance, this is our nursery where we raise a whole range of plants. We have been doing this work for nearly 20 years now. And every year during the monsoon, we go into these degraded forest patches and plant out a high diversity mix of uh, rainforest plants, and then we monitor their recovery. So here is a site which was a completely open area in 2002, and I'm just going to show you a few slides of how it has changed over time. So here is what it looked like in 2006 and in 2015. Here is another site which is a small patch, just a hectare in area. You can see how what it looked like in 2005. And this is what the site looks like today. As you can see visually, there is a lot of recovery of evergreen uh, you know, rainforest vegetation. But we also did studies where we tried to actually measure what was the extent of recovery in different attributes. And I won't go into the details of the of, of the of, of the work, but basically to say that we compared our restored sites with sites that were unrestored, that they were just left uh, by themselves to regenerate, and also in relation to the benchmark, the rainforests that we were trying to restore towards. And uh, here is a quick summary graph. I'm sorry about the uh, you know uh, the many details here, but I just want to uh, you know direct your attention to the light green graph in the center. Now that uh, separates the unrestored sites on the left uh, from the darker green, which is the benchmark rainforest on the right. And you can see that irrespective of what you are looking at, whether it is the density of trees, whether it is the number of species or the amount of carbon that is uh, now available in that, in that patch of forest, restored sites have definitely increased over sites that were just left to recover on their own. But this is after 15 years of recovery. And what this also says is that even after 15 years, we are nowhere close to the levels that are available in the benchmark or the undisturbed sites. So there is still quite a bit of way to go. Um, overall, whenever you will talk about restoration, there is you know two sides or two kinds of uh, hypotheses or you know approaches that people like to take. One, people say that nature knows best, so leave a site alone and leave it to regenerate. And at the other end, there are people who say, no, we need to intervene, we need to lend a helping hand through ecological restoration. So what we found is that it's not an either or situation, but uh, it depends on where you are uh, to uh, which approach is, is better. So if you're uh, in a degraded patch of forest, which is close to a large tract of existing forest, which is on the left of this graph, it is better to leave it to regenerate because all the effort of restoration actually does not make too much difference there. Uh, the sites are recovering quite well on their own. Whereas if you're far away from forest, the naturally regenerating sites don't do well because, you know, like Divya mentioned, the hornbills are not able to come there, the seed arrival is lower, the regeneration is poorer. And so uh, it makes more sense to lend a helping hand in such places. So that's the sort of uh, uh, you know, findings that we have from, from our work. And given that degraded forests are able to show at least this amount of recovery, what we also asked is whether it is reflected in the birds coming back. So I'm just going to show you one uh, graph right now, which will, will looks very similar to the graph I showed you for vegetation. You can see here that the number of rainforest bird species tends to be highest in the undisturbed or the benchmark rainforests, as, as you can imagine. But the restored sites are showing um, uh, slightly better number of bird species as compared to the unrestored sites. And we have tracked this in relation to the abundance of birds, as well as other changes in the composition of the bird community. And by and large, it, it does uh, show that Along with the recovery of the rainforests, the birds too are coming back, but there is still quite a, a, a long way to go in terms of it recovering to the same levels as that you find in undisturbed forests. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that this work basically shows that it's not whether a, a patch of forest is small or large. All those uh, 
forest patches that remain in the landscape have value and uh, uh, there is a potential to there is a need to conserve them and there is a potential to even enhance their conservation value through ecological restoration uh, we need to also keep in mind that it's not just the forest patches but it's also the surrounding landscape as divya also mentioned in her talk a lot of species like the malabar pied hornbill and uh, uh, and and many of the birds found here also occur in the landscapes around protected areas or the protected Uh, patches of forest so we need to uh, extend our conservation efforts and think about how we can enhance that those human use landscapes as well for conservation of birds but overall even after so many years of work and so much effort in restoring forests we know that they have not attained the levels of diversity and richness that we find in relatively undisturbed mature primary forests so they uh, are in many ways irreplaceable and that is something we should remember we cannot think that because restoration is showing some partial success that we can destroy or wipe uh, certain patches of forest and somehow compensate them by you know foresting another place or trying to restore in another place it uh, in many of these patches of forests are truly irreplaceable i'd like to thank uh, and end here by um, um uh, Uh, thanking a number of students who have worked with us over the years we have a, a large team of people who have helped us in the anomalies i thank gbcn for inviting us to uh, you know to speak here and uh, a, a lot of people who have also supported our work over the years thank you very much thanks a lot uh, sridhar and divya yeah, uh, that was really enlightening uh, <coughs> talk by both of you and there are so many uh, questions there that i think we'll need to you know uh, skim through uh, and so that you can answer i'm also bringing we'd like to up. apologize for uh, going slightly over time and for all the interruptions oh, it's all yeah. right it's all right i think that that's one of the glitches of being online uh, and taking everything online because if if the electricity or the internet doesn't support you things <clears throat> go away right so uh, thanks to both of you it was really amazing uh, for me it was also interesting because i made a checklist of nine yeah. species of birds from wherever you are sitting in goa so <laughs> that that was something really interesting nine species from so far away even cicadas in the background so you guys are living in an amazing paradise right there uh you know before uh, we kind of take questions from uh, uh, the public there is one question that i would like to you know uh, ask and uh, you know uh, get the ball rolling here so uh, sridhar you kind of spoke a lot about ecological restoration and uh, uh, you know uh, right now goa mm-hmm. is uh looking at these three linear projects which are going through the bhagwan mahavir wildlife sanctuary and national park you must be aware of that and often uh, policy and decision makers you know talk about compensatory afforestation and you know they look at uh, trees as unit and not a tree as an ecosystem because a tree is not an individual unit there are things right from the mycorrhizal fungi right till the uh, lichens on the bark to all the associated microorganisms on the leaf let's not even talk about the macrofauna there right so in this uh, perspective you know the first question that i have is what is the difference between the definition of classical afforestation and ecological restoration and does afforestation actually work uh, in this sense right i would want your comments on this to start the discussion from here yeah so um i think that if you look at what uh, afforestation is uh, is doing at least in the indian context where we have this uh, you know compensatory afforestation uh, authority the tampa authority and typically when a linear project or when your other projects are, are sanctioned uh, they say that okay you're losing this amount of forest and we will compensate that by planting an equal amount or a double amount of that area elsewhere right uh, a lot of this afforestation is actually being carried out on lands that were not forests to start with so it is not a reforestation there used to be forests and you're bringing back forests you're actually bringing forests onto land that were never forests in the first place so that is one of uh, the major concerns because you're losing habitats that used to be village commons wetlands grasslands savanna desert so many unique habitats which are uh, valuable in their own right are being planted with trees 
and which uh, you know there's a lot of work including from you know dr jagdish krishnasamy and others in atri have have shown that this can have severe negative effects on the hydrology and we also know that it has uh, bad uh, effects on the diversity of species that are typical to those ecosystems that's on this uh, that's where trees are planted in areas where people should not be planting trees in the name of afforestation but trees are also planted in areas which or you could say in a forest belt so they say okay this is compensatory afforestation this is a degraded forest and i am going to compensate it here even that has not been working very well because if you look at the government's own data it's available publicly in a website called egreenwatch.nic.in and you can download it and if you look at it one appalling uh, feature that you will see is that a majority of those afforestation programs use less than 5 tree species so all the afforestation that they are carrying out over hundreds of hectares if they are carrying them out correctly is using very very few species so you have a forest like in the western ghats or in northeast india or in central india which in one hectare you may have 40 to you know 100 plus uh, tree species you will end up going and planting five species and often they are the wrong uh, tree species to plant in that area also so it's a completely you know it's a perversion of what uh, you know people think of uh, you know whether you call it restoration or compensation it is not compensating anything and it is definitely not restoring the forest that you are supposed to restore so this is quite well known and in that sense um, uh, uh, most of these afforestation uh, projects are a, are a sham really and they are uh, having uh, you know detrimental effects not just on uh, on wildlife but also on people because there are people who use some of these forest areas for you know extracting forest produce and and so on and now they are being excluded from this by forest departments and you know projects uh, proponents coming in and saying no 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 this is an afforestation site we have planted teak trees or uh, amla trees or whatever and uh, they are denying people's access to resources besides having all these negative effects so i could go on for a long time on this but uh, basically you know it's 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 uh, it's there's very little positive that can be said about the afforestation programs that are going on in the country now if you wanted to add it right yeah uh, ecological restoration would mean a much more longer term commitment to uh, understand the system the biome that you're trying to restore be it grasslands or forests and planting planting up species that are most suitable for those regions and of a high diversity yeah and I just to one small point also since divya spoke uh, about the hornbills where is the discussion about the connections between the trees and all the other uh, you know life that depends on those trees they are never a part of a forestation programs nobody is even talking of them or thinking of them and the way they are being carried out it's not going to uh, create those links such as you know bringing back the hornbills that are then dispersing and you know really helping the forest recover a function to have a functional ecosystem or a healthy forest it's not happening right right uh, madhura if you could also come in because you have been one of the lead authors on one of the papers that's going to you know look into the peer review process of the you know eia and restoration plans now what what would be your comments on this you know, about ecological restoration versus the forestation that has been you know uh, spoken about in various you know eia documents that we have been looking at and after your comment we will start taking questions which are kind of directed to divya initially yeah i um, thank you pranay for uh, asking me this i i actually about the um, eia process and the the paper that we are working on we realized that there is so much that is really missing uh, um uh, from e yeah, the eia process and therefore what uh, uh, shridhar just mentioned about where is the connection where is the functional ecology happening and uh, that is sort of not given any attention at all when the eia says that okay we will plant we are we are cutting so many trees down we're going to plant so many trees and recently um, we also heard one of our ministers i guess the chief minister saying that oh we'll plant them in karnataka you know where uh, where is the all the three uh, linear uh, expansion three linear intrusions in uh, bhagwan mahavir are happening in goa so that's kind of really weird 
I I also wanted to just make one more comment uh, related to both Sridhar's and Divya's presentation. Uh, just today we were out near our farm, which is a coconut uh, supari areca nut plantation, and we saw Malabar pied hornbills there, a pair. And uh, we have uh, uh, near the um, I live near uh, the airport, and from there we go to this place called Verna Industrial Estate, which is an industrial estate. And until recently, we have been seeing great hornbills inside the industrial. state and they are reported oh. they are on ebird also these um, sp lists so imagine mm -hmm. that they really uh, i mean if you help them like you're saying you know give them a, a helping hand for these fragments of forest they can really recover and we can see these amazing species which are actually rainforest species in these uh, places so uh, mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, hope and scope but we need to we need to really um, think carefully of how we can You, you know, help these species grow instead of just uh, directly cutting down uh, uh, forests and stuff like that. And uh, I guess I should let um, Pranay uh, lead the uh, help uh, find out about what other people want to know, and then we'll comment and see what. Sure. Thanks, Madhura. So, uh, Divya, there is one question for you based on the presentation that you had you know, uh, given. So, the the question is on your screen as yeah. well. So, Ashra asks. can you elaborate on the tracking food availability behavior how does this affect their nest fidelity oh uh, yeah so actually they track uh, fruit resources like uh, you may know that fruits within a forest are very uh, uh what do you call it yeah. patchy uh, they are clumped or patchy so like not the entire forest is fruiting at the same time and i think it has been quite clearly shown that most frugivores are able to track and they have a mental map of where these food resources uh, resources are and despite being in the tropics they are quite seasonal within within those forest patches and so they are able to track these patchily distributed food resources across larger landscapes and most of this long distance tracking happens in the non breeding season so in the, during the breeding season they stick to a much smaller area close to their nest trees and so it it's uh, really not like you know they have to fly miles and get food if the fo uh, if the forests are in good condition and uh, i suppose one of the uh, uh things that um uh, one of the cues that the hornbills use to select a nest cavity would also be how much of food trees are available close by right uh yes there there is one more question uh, for for you from mabel who asks you said that malabar grey hornbill count is declining how to protect them we do not know why they are declining which is the saddest thing because i think one is of course they are the smallest hornbill uh, in the world actually they are just about 300 grams and they're not as attractive as the larger species so i think a lot of people have been ignoring them and it's uh, it's uh, it's a wonder that we've even managed to track their decline uh because you know people think that they are everywhere and only when you actually have their numbers do you realize that they are declining and we have no idea why they are declining like even in our landscape in the anomalies where we have been uh, monitoring them for uh, uh nearly 20 years now we did not realize that there was such a severe decline although we we did keep discussing saying that we are seeing fewer hornbills and uh, when we you know walked transects and actually uh, took that into account did we realize it uh but if you look at it uh we did not see any obvious changes in the landscape we are not losing forest it's not I, and in fact anomalies has one of the best protected forest in southern western ghats so we really do not know what's happening and uh, it is quite worrying uh, i think that's where more research and uh, better monitoring would help us understand what's happening really uh thanks uh, divya for that and i kind of have you know uh, a light question uh, based on one of my observations you know uh, so i was uh, traveling through electronic city over the uh, you know uh, flyover and i saw an indian grey hornbill you know sitting on a light pole and now that mm -hmm. got 
asking, you know, are, are, are hornbills also changing their behavior because we are messing with their habitats? Because uh, in Goa, we are seeing Malabar, uh, you know, gray hornbills, you know, coming right up to the big buildings which have glass windows, you know, coming there, you know, uh, trying to, you know, peck at the at their own reflection and yes. like that. And there, there was this uh, good paper on Indian birds where uh, in in Bhopal, if I'm not wrong, there was this nesting of Indian grey hornbill in in sanitary yeah. pipe, in, yes. in the wall, yeah. sanitary pipes and things like that. So, do you think they are also changing their behavior because we are kind of messing with their habitat? Messing with their habitat, yes, definitely. But I think most species are very adaptable. So there are certain things that they require, but I think most people will, oh, most people, I'm saying, <laughs> most species will try to survive. Uh, and uh, and what we do not know is the threshold beyond which they will not, you know, right. and um, and therefore I, I think that's also what is happening with the Malabar Grey, where we think that it is a small species, it is less specialized than great hornbills, but you know, there are something that is happening that is affecting them as well. Right. Thank you, Divya. So, uh, from Threshold, there is one question, I think, uh, for Dr. Sridhar, and it's on your screen. Uh, yeah. yeah, so if you can read that, that yeah. what's the low yeah. area threshold, no less than 20 hectares for rainforest birds, for old growth, healthy rainforests? By how much does this threshold change for newer or less healthy forests? Yeah. So a uh, very interesting question and um, we have just, you know, we have, we are still analyzing uh, that, uh, that information, but what is uh, clear is that you can have uh, forest patches that are even, you know, uh, in the range of about 10, 11 hectares or so, which are in good shape, which tend to have higher proportion of rainforest birds and more rainforest species than slightly larger patches in the 40 to 50 hectare range which are much more degraded because of you know historically they've lost most of their trees and whatever so that threshold does uh, as you rightly point out also depend on the condition of the forest but overall the condition of the forest comes out as one of the strongest uh, influences on whether a bird is found in that patch or at least using that patch you know uh, for foraging of course many of them may not breed there or stay in a small patch uh, throughout the year but they are at least found there they uh, come there regularly and you you know you get them in their accounts and so on so the threshold low area threshold of less than 20 hectares is more for the patches that are not you know hyper disturbed they are moderately to less disturbed patches and less than 20 hectares they can support quite a few rainforest birds right uh thanks uh Siddhar. and now we kind of have a very you know uh, something which is very common and a question that I have been asking to myself over uh, all the time and I think I want to bring Madhura also in the conversation here. So there's this question that in addition to understanding restoration and recovery, what can be done such that destruction doesn't occur in the first place? What is the role of various stakeholders like scientists and citizens in preventing destruction? Madhura, if we could start with you and then we can take Divya and Sridhar also you know, in the conversation. Um, I think uh, first, I mean, I can as a, as a scientist, I can just directly say that we engage with the with the conditions that are uh, causing the destruction. Like in this Molem case specifically, we have tried to bring uh, do a peer review. We have tried to uh, create awareness. We are trying to write more articles, get more students involved. So there are more studies like, you know, like the Vyaja spoke about. OK, we have a question like, why is the decline happening? We don't know. So there are so many things that we can actually bring out into the fore and say that the um, these things can be addressed by students and scientists. And um, that's, I think, as of now, we that's the only thing we can just engage with the process of destruction so that we can we know that this destruction will not happen or some uh, other, uh, you know, things like restoration can be more informative. Restoration in, especially in Goa, we need to also, I mean, I didn't, uh, we have, nobody has touched upon this, but mining is a big issue. So uh, there are abandoned mines which can be restored rather than only afforested, like uh, what Sridhar was saying. So uh, scientists can be involved in the process of restoration and the process of uh, deciding what, where destruction should not happen. That's right. um, what. Yeah. So uh, Divya, your comments on this question. Um, 
if I have to be really honest, I feel quite despondent sitting here, uh, particularly because I think in the last three, four months, we've signed more campaigns and campaign letters and pro uh, tried to provide whatever we could to support the campaigners. And I think that's one of the things that we can do because not all of us are capable of being out there. Uh, one is trying to understand the policies and uh, rules, engaging with the government and engaging with different kinds of stakeholders. But I think all of us with different expertise or uh, motivations have to come together to protect our environment. And, uh, and I think, although I'm not much on social media, but I think social media has really helped get a lot of us together like you know uh, I, I i doubt it if i would have known what is happening in molem unless there was so much uh you know shout about it uh in the social media and uh and also you know the actions it, it's happening much faster we have much better uh ability to communicate with each other to bring everybody together and i'm really grateful for all the people who are able to do that and uh, I think, again, as scientists who've been working in our little, little patches of forest or wherever, uh, if there is anything that we can do to support these campaigns, I think it would be really great to do that. Right. Uh, so I, I think the takeaway uh, here is that it, it's our responsibility as academicians and scientists to bring the information that is behind the paywall journals into very simple uh, format be it Wikipedia or be it anything that is accessible by the common man. Because at the end of the day, the research that we do is on the foundation of the taxpayers of this country. So I think it's our responsibility to bring information out there for everyone to access in such format that it is simple for people to understand. So I think that is our role to be an enabler uh, because and provide information for people who can then use the information to sharpen their knife uh, where it is required. So there is one question now uh, for Divya um, uh, from Dr. Badri from Madurai. Uh, so Dr. Badri asks, it is inferred from old books like the fauna of British India that the Indian grey hornbill was found throughout India up to Kanyakumari. It's practically not found in most of Tamil Nadu except near Pollachi and Erod right now. So what needs to be done to change this situation? Um. I I don't have a clear answer for that. I think uh, again, you know, just like many other species, we need to understand why they are disappearing. And uh, if it is not, I'm, I suppose most of the disappearances are because of uh, human activities. Uh, however, if you look at Indian grey hornbill, I'm surprised. I mean, not that I've seen them uh, way south. But uh, if you look at the eBird data and uh, their trends, it seems like they are spreading and they are uh, reported from many more places than were known before. So I'm slightly surprised. So I don't know for a species that is kind of doing all right, whether we should take or put in more effort to bring them into some places, unless you think that it is a key species to bring them back to. So there's an allied question as well from Dr. Badri who asks uh, to see that, that based on your rich experience in rainforest restoration, what will be your recommendations for gardens in the Western Ghat towns like Munar and Valpare? Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot that we uh, try and you know recommend or try to work with uh, people here on an almost daily basis. But if I had to pinpoint two or three things, one is that let us try and retain whatever few forest patches remain in the landscape. Whether they are small or large, whether they have been uh, you know, planted with cardamom long back and abandoned or whatever, whatever remains, we need to make sure that we uh, protect them. And that requires uh, quite a bit of effort because if you look at most of these plantations, if you go and look at their maps, the estate maps, the forest patches will not even be marked there they'll be marked as blank areas. So they have just been moved out of the radar, out of, and it's understandable for someone who's trying to mainly, con, you know, uh, grow tea or coffee, but uh, even for forest departments, uh, often don't look at these forest patches, which are, because they are outside the protected area. They're not inside uh, a reserve. So first uh, step would be to 
try and identify every single patch of forest that remains and see as far as possible to retain them. The second thing that we can do is uh, take up some areas which are very degraded, which occupy crucial positions in the landscape and see if we can restore them. Uh, through methods such as what we have tried here and a few others in the Western Ghats have also successfully you know, done uh, ecological restoration. We can focus our efforts on particular places which are where it is uh, most relevant. But let us not also ignore the surrounding landscape, like I said. If people can be motivated to grow more trees in tea plantations, not simply use silver oak, which is an Australian tree, or if they can continue to use a lot more native species as shade trees and coffee, uh, rather than you know switching just to a few uh, convenient species, that will also help a lot in conservation of uh, species in, in in the Western Ghats. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, and there's some echo. So there's one more question uh, which comes from Anand. It's also uh, you know uh, directed to you. So how much effort was put in looking at diversity of grasses, herbs, lichens, orchids, climbers, and ferns, insects, frogs, species, or other invertebrates. Doesn't this method of planting climax species bypass natural succession and have a bias towards trees and megafauna? What do you think will be the impact on soil? It's a really interesting question. Yes, yeah. And so, uh, you know, there have been some work done, uh, that at least two parts there. One is why are we focusing on trees? And uh, second, the method of uh, not, uh, you know, whether we should follow the successional trajectory to reach the forest or try and, uh, you know, jumpstart it by going uh, to species that are found in uh, uh, sort of mature forests. So why we focus on trees is because a lot of these areas are uh, heavily invaded because of the disturbance, the past disturbance there. They have a lot of invasive plants like lantana and mycania and so on, which grow in tangles and more or less arrest the vegetation. There is very little succession. The naturally regenerating sites, you know, the unrestored sites that we compared have been left as is for 20 years, but they have changed very little because of these, the presence of these weeds and the suppressing uh, elements. So succession, even if you wanted to allow the succession to happen, it's not happening. It's being arrested. So we are able to take that out. And the reason why these weeds proliferate a lot is because of sunlight. There's a lot, they are light demanding plants. So in that sense, in at least in the wet forest zone, ecological restoration tries to bring back the canopy as soon as possible. So if you can bring back trees that provide shade at, you know, at even a three to five meter height, that helps immensely in the forest recovering because it suppresses the weeds, it allows the trees to grow and once as these grow, it allows other plants to come in in the understory. So our hope was that as these trees establish, the microclimate and everything changes, that herbs, orchids, ferns, many of these other plants will come in. We haven't done research on that. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we were photographing an orchid that had grown on a tree that we planted 15 years ago. And uh, there are a few, you know, anecdotal sort of examples like this. But by and large, there is still quite a bit to go. We have not seen the kind of recovery in the herbaceous plants that we would have uh, anticipated. And, um, you know, maybe there is uh, uh, a need to, to do that as a subsequent step later. Uh, and if I may add, you know, in, in the rainforest regions where we work, which is the restoration that we are doing, the trees are the backbone of those rainforests. And I think they are like Sridhar already mentioned that they will uh, help recover the microclimatic conditions as well. Uh, but having said that, we, are, we also know that it's going to take a long time, even if you are trying to plant climax species. And uh, uh, that's exactly why we are saying, let us not lose what we already have. We will not be able to bring back all the components ever, ever. Right. And, and uh, one, I'd just, just like to add one more thing, uh, going back to what Madhura was saying, is that, you know, uh, and also you, Prana, is not just about uh, communicating our findings and our research findings when the crisis happens. I think we need to be constantly doing it. We can't start writing about molem or animales just when, you know, they're just planning to cut everything down. I think we need to 
be prepared for such uh, eventualities. Right. Thanks, Divya. And uh, Madhura, if you could also take up uh, this, because there was a very similar question, and then you, a lot of the work has been on invasive species. So if you would also want to you know, uh, give your insights on this, based on this question, so what is the impact of invasive species on the unrestored patches in comparison to patches with the restoration initiative? Sridhar has already answered a lot on this lines, but since you have also work, done a lot of your work on invasive species, so your uh, opinions on invasive species and restoration, mm -hmm. secondary successions. I think they, I think that's uh, not comparable at all. I think uh, Devya also just mentioned and uh, Sridhar just said that they are, uh, I mean, uh, restoration in um, restoration just completely restores the whole thing to uh, tries to go back to the original ecosystem, although we don't, uh, we can't get there. And like um, Divya just said uh, that uh, restore or Sridhar said that restoring the canopy is very important. The invasive species are looking for sunlight, Lantana, Mycania, all these species. So invasive species will uh, spread and grow a lot and they will not allow the native species to come back. So in in unrestored fragments, they will uh, even like uh, the study that Sridhar mentioned that uh, let nature take its path versus actively get involved in restoration. So let nature take its path is wait for these invasive species to die down and let the pioneers grow and then the, eco the ecosystem come back. But that doesn't, it takes forever or may not even happen. It may be a new stable state. So um, I think it is better that uh, you participate and do active restoration and um, then only the invasive species can be controlled or to an extent and very actively get them out. I'm sure they also have, uh, Sridhar and uh, Divya have a lot of experience down south also with wattle and all kinds of other things that are there. Uh, so yeah, that's what yeah. I would like. Thanks, thanks Madhura. So we'll quickly move to another question uh, to Sridhar uh, from Shraddha who asks, uh, Sridhar men Dr. Sridhar mentioned about the health of the habitat that matters and not the area. What determines this health of habitat? Yeah, so um, in the context of rainforest birds, what we tried to uh, uh, measure as, so in other words, I used was the quality of the habitat are uh, uh, things like the density of trees, the extent of canopy closure, the diversity of trees that are found there, uh, and whether you have, uh, typically in rainforest, for instance, your vegetation spread from uh, very low levels all the way to the top. So how many different layers of vegetation there are? All of these are ways and whether, you know, again, uh, whether there are invasive species found there and so on. So you take all of these measurements and then you compare that with relatively undisturbed forests and you see to what extent that is captured by these, these variables. The closer you are to that in, in, in these variables of quality, the better it tends to be for the rainforest birds. So that's what I uh, was trying to get. Yes. Uh, so Divya, there is one uh, very quick question for you as well, since we were you know, talking about adaptation. So is it a good sign that birds are so-called adapting to uh, other means as mentioned? So is it a good sign or a bad sign? How, how do you look at adaptation or change to changing? Uh, you know, I think things? it's a good sign for the species, but I think overall health of the ecosystems and forest it might be a bad sign but i think uh, it's a good thing that most of the species are plastic like for example in the anomalies we have the lion tail macaques and they're coming out into the towns in the last few years and this had never happened before so it's good that ltms are not just arboreal and they can move and hopefully they will find another patch of forest but then they also might just find garbage and food and all that because of tourism in the town and stay here. And our reactions towards them would not be of awe anymore, but you no, know, like we will be treating like them like we treat rhesus macaques or bonnet macaques elsewhere. And that I think is a fairly sad state of affairs. Right. So uh, uh, one question from my end, uh, you know, uh, with very similar. So we were talking about adaptation. So one of the projects that's happening in Goa is this high tension wire, with a four, four, 440 kV uh, high tension wire that's going to go through, uh, you know, prime rainforest areas, which is a very good habitat for great uh, hornbills, Malabar pied hornbills and Malabar grey hornbills. So uh, 
you know, a lot of mitigative strategies have been suggested for avoiding this in collisions with the high tension wires uh, because a lot of these hornbills you know fly from within the canopy from tree to tree and then there is a high probability that they you know collide with these high tension wires do you think some of these uh, you know mitigative strategies that are mentioned in uh, popular uh, literature you know do they really work or is it just you know a whitewashing or rather greenwashing uh, problems as i would call them yeah, oh, yeah. so uh, you know i was involved in uh, trying to write some uh, a background paper for the previous national board for wildlife on the effects of linear intrusions so i've been you know following uh, this for quite a, a period of time there is evidence there is evidence that if you have properly deployed um, you know structures they can help in reducing collisions with birds uh, for instance birds like cranes and bustards in very open terrain where you have these power lines which are uh, marked with uh, you know different kinds of things we so far don't have any information from forest environments we know that there have been collisions even in the anomalies we know of a case where great hornbills have collided with a power line and died and uh, so that uh, that risk is there we do not know if it will work in the forest context i am not aware of any literature of power lines going through forest marked with this and you know birds being able to avoid it second thing i want to add is that it is not just that uh, risk of electrocution because it's a power line that is a problem the fact that that power line exists it is cutting right through the forest it has broken the forest into two pieces and it's created this huge opening that is going right through is a very serious matter because there's a lot of other uh, effects that uh, such power lines uh, bring in uh, including the spread of weeds that come in there is higher risk of fire and because it is uh, exposed the forest gets more desiccated uh, larger trees fall the large trees fall because of higher wind speeds along this as far as i know mitigation doesn't look at any of them they just say it's a power line uh, so you know electrocution we will put this to prevent electrocution but it's just one of many many detrimental effects that a power line like that can have when it goes through forest like in molen and also different species will respond to different kinds of mitigation measures i think i uh, i think some of the things that they're using for cranes is not working for bustards for example so yeah uh thanks both of you and then i'm going to take a last question uh, before we kind of wrap up uh today's lovely uh, talk and discussion that we have had a very uh, big question that is taking half of our screen so uh, regarding the restoration efforts the social compositions and the kind of dependence of the people in anomalies has also been an integral component of the success what can be done when human use is equally critical to some of the spaces for example places critical of for pastoral communities where the problem is not grazing but lopping and cutting especially when in the name of restoration the department is planning uh, planting species not part of the ecosystem but of economic value madhura madhura would you like to take that first yeah. can you put up the question again yes sir yes. i understand that yes. she is talking about plantations uh, in the name of restoration the department is planting species yeah i i don't Someone think uh, yeah 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 i i think uh, yes. yes can you hear yes. me yes yes please go ahead so i think yeah i think um, you, you uh, one would have to really do more studies to find out what kind of human use is being done over there and what kind of species can be planted versus not planted like forest department is planting some which are not native to that place but they may be native to the subcontinent and it may be okay to plant them there or something like that but uh, like for example in goa you could plant something which grows in maharashtra or down south but not somewhere something which grows somewhere completely far away but not silver oak or something like that so those kinds of studies or uh, can maybe can help in uh, deciding what can happen there and maybe uh, since sridhar and devya have worked more on restoration i would like i mean what would they want to say yeah so i i'll just add one thing which is that 
you know when you think of a lot of conservation efforts conservation efforts tend to portray humans as a problem and try to separate them from nature and saying that okay as far as we can remove all the people uh, you know everything will be will be fine now ecological restoration is a very different mindset you cannot do ecological restoration without the involvement of people it is a very human intensive uh, activity uh, by and large and in many of the cases such as you know uh, she mentioned in the in the question people are using land and if you see them as part of of that landscape that you're trying to restore then your approach will be slightly different you're not trying to restore an ecosystem which is somehow completely insulated hermetically sealed from the influence of people but an uh, but an ecosystem that will continue to give benefits to to people in most such cases people have a good understanding of a range of species and the sort of benefits they can get from there and there have been cases where people have also restricted their own uh, levels of use of certain parts of the landscape they regenerated certain hills because they understand it's part of a water catchment or a place from where they can collect you know leaf litter whereas they continue to use some other areas more intensively there have been many such uh, examples you know there have been other institutions who have been doing working closely with communities keystone foundation in the western ghats fes in parts of india and you know others in 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 the north as well so we have to look for those opportunities where we work with the people to do this and not uh, take uh, that uh, their uh, you know their role completely right. away Ordinance. and hand it to the forest department which uh, you know it really doesn't work they are not uh, usually trained uh for this and in most cases they uh, you know end up uh, doing uh, what is inappropriate uh, from a ecological perspective or even from a social ecological perspective all right uh, thanks a lot i think with that it's a wrap uh, for today evening's uh, session a lot of uh, people have joined in for today's session and have made it a very uh, you know interesting interactive session so i thank everyone here who has you know joined us and has asked uh, or several interesting questions and you know we could make this a really and a truly interactive session uh, that we have had uh, with this you know i would want to uh, you know uh, invite omkar to kind of come and you know give a small vote of thanks omkar is the president of uh, current president of goa bird conservation network but mm -hmm. before omkar comes in i would want to thank the backbone of uh, you know the carl de selva memorial lecture series and that is barbara uh, de silva uh, barbara has been uh, the, you know uh, the person who has been behind us providing us rock solid support for uh, the five years that we have been doing this and has you know generously shared with us carl's work and has also helped us raise funds uh, which we have been putting to good use uh, while doing outreach and education programs in various schools colleges at panchayat level at municipality level and you know it it has helped us a lot in trying to develop these uh, programs and activities so a very big thanks to uh, barbara for being a, a huge support for us and you know continuing the vision that carl had for the birds and the bird watchers of goa so a very big thanks to barbara as well and uh, with that i think we are at the end of today's uh, uh, fifth uh, carl de selva memorial lecture Uh, yes omkar if you can unmute uh, yourself and if you could you know uh, you know uh, begin with the word of thanks for today uh, first of all yes. uh, i would like to thank dr deva and dr shankarvan for their time and uh, providing us uh, insights into the lives of onbills as well as uh, in uh, ecological restoration as well i think uh, everyone who has been listening today uh, has learned a lot from uh, this informative talk uh, i would also like to thank uh, all the viewers i think for uh, asking such brilliant questions as well i think uh, some of the questions were uh, really i mean uh, truly uh, good and uh, it basically helped to share a lot of information i think whatever res research uh, you have done i think that uh, very much uh, disseminated to the public that's been listening today uh, thank you madhura also for joining uh, in the discussion as well as adding your inputs to the uh, session uh, uh, pranay for hosting and arranging everything uh, for the carl de silva event and uh, 
most of all i think uh, for barbara for supporting this event uh, through the five years that we've been doing it uh, and last all the viewers that have been uh, patiently uh, listening as well as joining the discussion as well uh, thank you everyone yeah thanks a lot with that it's a wrap on the fifth kaldesalva memorial lecture we hope that the next lecture that we have is uh, you know uh, on a public platform when we could actually meet all of uh, all of us in you know, all of us can meet together on a real time platform rather than on a virtual platform and that is in the true essence of bird watching because bird watching finally leads into networking and those networks are in you know, a friendships for lifetime that are built so with that Uh, big thanks to Adivya and Sridhar, and again in remembrance of Carl for his amazing and colorful personality, because of which we birders in Goa have, you know, kept on striving towards his vision. Thanks a lot. With uh, good evening to everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all.